And I'm Luke Silva from Foley & Lardner here in Boston. Alexia Abadat from Claris Law in New York. We're going to talk about IP and augmented reality. Um, AR raises a ton of different legal issues and challenges, so we think it's sort of a unique area, and, and you know, uh, I'm just going to do some sort of issue spotting today. So, Alexia, please take it away. So the reason we put this slide together was just to have in one place some of the words that you might come across. And the hope, frankly, is that you come across these words before somebody else's lawyer sends you a letter with some of these words that are on it. So really, this slide, you have the First Amendment in the middle, and we just wanted it as a reminder. There are a lot of misconceptions about the law. There are a lot of myths out there. A lot of people think, oh, I'm creating content 100% protected by the First Amendment. Doesn't matter what I do. Sometimes that's true, but it's not because you're creating content that you're always going to be able to hide yourself behind a First Amendment shield. So it's something to bear in mind. These are some of the words that hopefully you've seen them before or that hopefully when you're developing your content, they can serve as little triggers. And on that, I'll just uh, sort of go briefly through, you know, what the different areas of IP law are because, you know, you, you can't protect everything. I think the goal, especially if you're in a startup, is to prioritize and have sort of a holistic IP strategy and, you know, think about what really matters to your business, um, not only to protect your ideas and to protect, you know, yourself from potentially infringers, but also to get investors. And, you know, especially VCs want to see that you have a strategy in mind and that you're spending your money wisely. So, um, you know, you can't protect everything. But we have everything from, uh, you know, trade secret on the right here is basically free to protect um, and can last forever to patents, you know, design patents and utility patents, which are pretty short in duration and can cost a lot of money to protect. So, again, it's just a matter of thinking through what is your business, what are your goals, and, you know, how much resources do you have to protect uh, your intellectual property at each, at each phase um, of your company. And so on that, um, you know, people think about, especially in the tech world, think about patents as sort of the end-all, be-all. But, um, you know, if you have an idea and you're, you know, solving a problem through your company, I mean, that's probably something that could be protected with patents. Um, but the expression of that idea, like if you're creating content, probably that would be protected by copyrights or, tr or your trademark of your business. So just, you know, there's a lot of different uh, facets to an intellectual property strategy. And, um, you know, it's important to not just think about one thing, but to think about, again, the broader, you know, implications for your company. Uh, and on that, there's a couple of bullet points here about theft of ideas, NDAs, work for hire agreements. Um, I won't go through all the details, but basically, you know, you're going to need to share your information at times with collaborators, with people you hire, whoever. Um, it's obviously important to have agreements in place to protect that, um, but just think about who you're entering into these agreements with and, you know, where are they located? The laws of some countries make it pretty hard to uh, enforce an NDA even if you have one in place. So, you know, the best thing to do is not to share confidential information, but if you have to, uh, we get that. Um, you know, just, just be careful about it and I think have sort of robust agreements in place to govern um, what happens to that information. Agreed. So this slide is once you're at the stage of designing your content. What do you put in there? What are some of the things you're going to think about? Copyright is a big one. You want to use somebody else's content, something that someone else has created. What can you do? You can either license it, pay for it, or you can fair use it. And fair use is this concept that there are so many myths out there online about what a fair use is and what is not. A fair use is when the law allows you to use a certain amount of content that you have not created that somebody else owns the copyright in, in your work. And please, this is one of the reasons we put these words up here. There are myths out there such as you can use 10% of the words in a book and it's a fair use. You can use two lines out of a song and it's a fair use. If it's for educational purposes, it's a fair use. You can use the whole thing. None of those are true. There's unfortunately no formula as to what is or what isn't a fair use. But generally, it's are you taking content and adding something new to it? Are you transforming it? Are you, is the reason when somebody looks at it and the way you've used it different than what the person's getting when they looked at it when the creator did it? So for example, if you wanted to augment a children's book, let's say The Hungry Caterpillar, if you augment the whole book without permission of the author, probably not a fair use. But are you just taking one shot of the caterpillar in a collage of augmentations of famous children's books and icons? Maybe. And the other thing, just practically, is there are some copyright holders that you just do not want to mess with without going to ask their permission because they are litigious. They're known. They're out there. Um, there have been a number of cases involving the Harry Potters. 
if you're going to go and do 50 shades of augmented gray, I would suggest you speak to a lawyer first. Um, there are litigious copyright holders out there that you just know after a while to tread a little more carefully with. Um, and the last two on the slide, the right of publicity, if you are using a known person in your augmentation, we saw earlier, for example, there are, you hold a phone and you can see a famous athlete and you can walk around them. When you're using somebody who can otherwise monetize their name and their likeness, what they look at, that's also something to think about. You don't always have to approach them, but if there is a commercial aspect to it, that's when you should start thinking about the right of publicity. And finally, libel. Are you hurting the reputation of someone in your content? We've seen examples of augmented reality where, for example, you scan a product and it tells you if it was ethically made or if there was any kind of illegal labor involved or how much sugar there's in it. You want to be sure that if you're including any facts in whatever you're showing with your augmentation that you've got it right because you might otherwise rub someone the wrong way. Especially alternative facts. Those can be very dangerous, right? <laughs> Okay, so IP is everywhere. This is a very self-serving slide for an IP attorney, I realize, <laughs> but here's your Coke can and all the different types of IP. You have you know, a patent that might protect how the can is made, uh, how the can is opened could be patented. You have the a recipe for Coke, which is the you know, sort of stereotypical trade secret. Um, you know, the logo and the imagery on the can is pro you know, trademarked and even subject to copyright protection. So just just gives you an idea in your everyday running of your business. Again, if this is from a startup perspective, you know, you're creating a lot of IP, whether you know it or not, and you know, you're not gonna protect all of it, but it's just something to think about, um, you know, when you're thinking about your product and your packaging and all that. There's all there's a lot of you know intellectual property embedded in, in everything that you see. And to the extent that that would that there was any copyright in that bottle, that for example is a fair use. We're using it to discuss, we're using it to teach something else. We're not using it for the purpose of marketing another product like Coca-Cola. And I'm a patent lawyer. I don't know what fair use is. I just call Alexia when I have a question <laughs> about that. Um, and then this is sort of a related idea, which is, you know, how is your content being used out in the real world? So there have been some cases you might have heard about a Pokemon Go, Niantic being sued for its users trespassing on people's land or leaving litter or, you know, making a ruckus when they're playing the game, on, you know, in people's backyards and things. And none of these cases have actually resulted in any rules that you can't do that and that you're going to be held responsible. But, you know, if you're encouraging people to do, you know, illegal things or, infringe upon the rights of others, um, and that's reasonably foreseeable to you that they might do that, you might want to be careful at least put in your terms of use that, you know, you're on your own and I'm not responsible for any of that. It might not completely insulate you, but just, you know, another thing to think about is how is my product going to be used out there in the real world? Biometrics, hot topic, fun use of it in AR. Biometrics, essentially, whether you're talking about retina, eye scans, face scans, hand geometry, fingerprints, there are a number of states that have laws on the use of biometrics if your product is using scanning any kind of biometrics. There's no law at the federal level. So for example, copyright, which we were just discussing, patents as well, these are federally regulated at the federal level, not so for biometrics. So depending on where you're marketing your product, these are things you should be thinking about. There are to date only three states that have specific biometric statutes, which are the ones up there. And the one particularly to note is Illinois. Illinois applies to commercial and non-commercial use. So let's say your app scans faces during the Super Bowl so that the colors of your favorite team, you know, like makeup on your face, but it does nothing beyond that. It's still going to be caught by the statute in Illinois because the Illinois statute applies to commercial and non-commercial. Unless that app is then selling it or disclosing it to third parties, it wouldn't apply in Texas and Washington. So it's something to think about, and as a rule of thumb, collect what you ask for, and that's a good place to start. Okay, and advertising and endorsements. So here, also, think about your product. What your, are you creating an impression in your product that it's being endorsed by someone or a company when it's not? It can be very easy. The whole point of augmented reality, or one of the points, is you're blurring the difference between what's real and what's augmented. So let's say, you have earphones that tell you when you're driving, oh, you might like this restaurant based on your past you know, use of Google Maps, but in fact, that restaurant has paid the app so that it gets recommended. That is something as the user that you would have to know. That is something as the app maker that you have to make sure that your end user is going to be clear about that. And same thing, sort of if you're presenting something as sort of unbiased content, but it's actually paid content. Right. So if you're 
sort of deceiving people into thinking that you're just giving them information when in fact you're giving them an advertisement, that can cause a problem too. So plenty of things to worry about. This is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Thought, you know, we just spot a few issues for everyone. So hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions, you can find us online, of course, or we'll be floating around after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you.